All right, I wanna welcome everyone to the digital dialogue series on uh, place um, and its role in conservation um, and around the Grass and Tua project. Uh, last uh, two weeks ago, we had Dr. Dan Williams here um, giving his talk. I will share the link uh, for that so that people who maybe missed it can get a chance to go back and watch Dr. Williams' presentation. He also shared with us a list of his work cited uh, page for that, if people want to dig into some of that literature uh, that's there for the taking. Um, but today we're excited to have Dr. Elena Bennett um, with us to talk. Uh, when we put together this series, uh, we mentioned we were you know, putting together a series on place and place-based conservation. And uh, Dr. Claudio Gratton, a colleague of mine here at Madison said, oh my gosh, if you're doing a talk on that, you got to get Dr. Elena Bennett to come give a talk. So. Carl Wepkin and I reached out to uh, Dr. Bennett and she gracefully, uh, graciously said yes. So we're really happy to have her. Um, correcting our wrongs from last week where we had Dr. Williams, uh, PhD from the University of Minnesota. We have, we brought in a badger this week. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Bennett received her master's in land resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and also her PhD in limnology and marine sciences. Um, today, Dr. Bennett is a professor and chair in sustainability science at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Um, her research focuses on the interactions among ecosystem services and how we can manage these interactions for a multifunctional working landscape. Um, she was the leader of the Monterigi Connection Project, which I hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad. I, I asked Dr. Bennett for some help before we started. Uh, that worked with stakeholders to understand the role of landscape connectivity in the provision about a dozen ecosystem services and how those might change across a range of future scenarios, which um, when I read that uh, part of her bio, it seems like such a fit with what we're trying to do in collaborative landscape design and the Grassland 2 project about envisioning a future through a collective uh, meaning making process. Um, so with all that in mind, we were really excited to have Dr. Bennett uh, for this series. She seems like such a great fit and uh, also a great fit with uh, the approach taken in Grassland 2 out. So with that, I uh, want to welcome uh, Dr. Bennett and um, let her take the floor from here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it is, I'm so excited to be here. First of all, I mean, I was hoping to like get the invitation to actually come to Wisconsin, but uh, I'll take this. I can see some folks background with the terrace there. So that's, I'm going to take it as good enough uh, good enough for me for now and hopefully get to come see you all in, in person at some point. So let's see um, if I can share my screen here and then we'll share that and there we go. So um, I was really excited about this. I mean, in part, I've been following uh, this Grasslands 2.0 just with like incredible enthusiasm and excitement about what you all are doing because I'm, I am just very excited about it. And in part, I've been pondering, uh, taking a left turn from the science papers I normally write and writing a book about place and the importance of place in conservation. So this putting this together gave me a chance to sort of think through some of my thoughts on that. It's gonna be a little bit sprawling, but hopefully just brings up some interesting uh, thoughts and ideas that we can have conversation about. So, um, so I ran into this quote just the other day uh, from Teddy Roosevelt, and um, it really struck me. Uh, so the nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets, which it must turn over to the next generation increased and not impaired in value, and it behaves badly if it leaves the land poor to those who came after it. That's all I mean by the phrase conservation natural resources, use them, but use them so that as far as possible, our children will be richer and not poorer because we have lived, um, which really resonates with me. And where I saw it actually um, was, this is the quote that leads off the new US national strategy to develop statistics for environmental economic decisions. So this is kind of their approach to uh, to conservation and one way of thinking about what conservation is. And I'll just mention that strategy is open for comment. Comments are due Friday, and I would encourage you to go take a look at it and, uh, and consider commenting. Here's a totally, uh, I shouldn't say totally different. Here's another perspective uh, from a book that I'm rereading right now as I think about place. This is from Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, 
And um, what she says is a worldview uh, in which land was understood as sacred as our sustainer, our pharmacy, our identity, our home, our library, the place where the moral where we play out the moral responsibility in return for our very lives peopled with non-human relatives. So, um, you know, a kind of different but also place-based approach. And I have all kinds of questions about this. Like, can these work in concert with one another? Do they work, does one work at one scale and another at another scale or one at one time and another at a different time? And if so, when and how? Um, uh, because they're different and yet similar. Um, so they bring up a lot of questions for me. What I want to do today is introduce you to uh, this project called ResNet, um, which is a pan-Canadian network that I'm directing right now. It is uh, place-based, it is transdisciplinary, and that we're working directly with local communities uh, about multifunctional, I've written here multifunctional agriculture. Most of our sites focus on agriculture, but some are more timber production or fisheries production or energy production. Um, and, um, and it's multi-scale. So I wanna get at this multi-scale part um, because how do we do place-based science in a way that is multi-scale is a question that is on my mind. So we're trying to do uh, three different things. One is answer stakeholder or rights holders or local community questions about land management. Uh, we're trying to do science that changes what we understand about ecosystem services. And we're trying to use one and two to contribute to Canada's national ecosystem service monitoring system. That is a new thing that was recently announced by the government of Canada. They're putting in uh, $25 million to start and then I think five or 6 million per year every year after that to somehow develop a census by which they're going to monitor ecosystem services across Canada. And they came to us and said, okay, what do we monitor? What are the right indicators? to advance sustainability across multiple scales. So here's that scale uh, question again. So uh, I mentioned we have six landscapes. They stretch all the way from uh, the Eastern part of Canada in the Bay of Fundy to uh, the West where we're looking at uh, indigenous management of coastal Pacific fisheries, all the way from uh, the South where we're looking at prairie potholes in uh, in Manitoba to uh, up in the Northwest Territories where we're looking at new opportunities for agricultural expansion. Um, and in all of these, we've uh, talked to local folks and figured out a series of different uh, ecosystem services that they're uh, interested in uh, knowing about and that we can measure in those, um, in those landscapes. And I'll come back later and talk uh, a little bit more about, uh, about how this works. Um, and then we have some themes that are uh, what we're able to use to try to scale up that through thinking about mapping and modeling and monitoring and uh, how do we synthesize this, um, this information through these commonalities. So I wanna give you a couple more overarching thoughts about where I'm coming from. Uh, with all of this, where we're coming from in, in, in ResNet before I sort of jump into uh, a little bit more uh, data-driven stuff. Um, so in at least a, a fair amount of conservation science, um, we sort of argued in the proposal that we wrote that there's a lot of this kind of stuff, which I would say is like, how do people impact nature? So, you know, that's things like what I worked on for my PhD, looking at how uh, fertilizer use in uh, suburban, urban, and agricultural areas can impact water quality. Um, and there's a fair amount of, of that. There's also maybe more recently, uh, a fair amount of this, that's maybe some of the stuff that I've been doing more recently, like, uh, how does nature contribute to human well-being through the provision of ecosystem services? Um, and what we were arguing is that there's not so much that does both or that looks at kind of the relationships between people and nature uh, in the middle. Although I think we're seeing that more and more. And when I read through some of the Grassland 2.0 stuff, I see a fair amount of that actually coming through. That's the part that I think really interests 
me, interests us in ResNet. Um, if I put that a different way, uh, Georgina Mace walked through kind of a different sorts of framing of conservation where in the 60s and 70s, we maybe had uh, nature for itself and it was just about sort of keeping nature separate from people. You know, how many parks can we create and keep people out? Um, and then that moved in the 80s and 90s into, okay, if we can't keep people out, how do we at least keep them from having a bad impact uh, on nature? Um, that then moved into with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, more thinking about how nature provided benefits for, uh, for people. And then finally, I would argue, you know, where we are, are now, which is this sort of struggle to understand people and nature together. How do we do uh, science and management and work together in a way that, uh, that thinks about those uh, as mutual relationships? Um, so when we think about what our relationships are with nature, we often look at a picture like this and we maybe see the assets. And once upon a time, that might have been like the asset is timber. More recently, I think we've expanded our vision to say, oh, there's timber, but there's also places to recreate, there's carbon storage, there's maybe habitat for non human species. Um, but there's other things that might happen here too, right? There's relationships that are formed between people and nature as people walk through this area. Um, or between people and other people as they work to uh, maybe restore this, uh, this place. And through those relationships, that helps shape our sense of what this place is. And I think your speaker last week talked a lot about how engaging with landscape uh, affects our sense of what place is. Um, and we come to define this landscape as a place and it comes to define us. And if I think about that in terms of agricultural landscapes where we might look at something like this and see uh, food production, and I guess we, I should clarify, I mean my research scientist community, um, but of course there's real relationships that are going on all over the place in this uh, landscape, even if my, my scientific community is largely ignoring them. And that, that ignorance means we're making all kinds of really critical, important decisions in a kind of piecemeal, isolated fashion with a limited picture of the ecological, the economic, the social risks that are associated with those uh, decisions. So what that means is if we want some shared future of prosperity, of good health, of good well-being for ourselves and for other species, we have to figure out how we're going to manage relationships between social and ecological systems. And to me, that has to do with understanding and accepting our place as members of the broader landscape community, but maybe also from measuring. And so if I come back around to what uh, Statistics Canada is asking us to do relative to their Canadian census, you know, how can we build the science that integrates across services across sectors across landscapes that enables us to envision a resilient future and understand how the kinds of decisions we make today uh, get us towards that resilient future or don't get us towards that resilient uh, uh, kind of future. Um, it's maybe a good moment for me to say I, I love working on landscapes where there's all this complexity of relationships between people and nature so where in the world of ecologists, like the rest of my department here, um, they might often ask me, you know, hey, why don't you work in like pristine wetlands or in that beautiful national park over there? Um, but it's those places are pretty, but they're not um, they're not my place. I would say, I guess this is my place. Um, okay, so based on my title and the things I've said so far, or maybe uh, if you know a little bit about the work that I've done. A lot of this is about using ecosystem services, the benefits that people get from nature as a way to measure or quantify those services. I do that because I think ecosystem services gives us a way to measure across space and time and sectors um, in a way that's really compelling. And I think it's, um, 
it's a really good tool, but while it's really simple and compelling as a concept, how we actually quantify services, I think is, uh, is a lot more, uh, is a lot more complex um, than that. Um, I'm actually going to skip over that for the, for the time being, because I want to sort of get into um, uh, some of the actual places that we've worked and what we're learning. And I'll come back to that framework again in a little bit. Um, so um, John mentioned the Monteregi connection. Um, really, actually, I sometimes say that my focus on the sort of transdisciplinary working with communities came for me from this project, but actually it came from some of the farmers that I talked to when I was doing my PhD in Wisconsin, who um, very kindly, but very straightforwardly, uh, you know, told me in no uncertain terms that there was going to be another grad student out here in three or four years with a totally different idea. And meanwhile, I will have moved on to some other place. Uh, and they would be the ones, you know, there uh, living out the solutions in the landscape and that I needed to do a better job of, um, of listening to them. And that really opened my eyes to how much richness there was to be had in, uh, in working with communities and how much um, we had to learn from each other, how much I had to learn by um, becoming a better listener. So I've spent a long time trying to do that. I hopefully am better at it now. This Monteregi Connection was a project, it was built around working with local communities. We uh, had official partners, uh, 13 mayors. Every mayor here uh, in Quebec has a land use planner who's responsible for land use planning for that municipality. And the municipalities are arranged in MRCs, which is roughly like a county. Um, you might think of it in the, in the States. And so we met with these folks every four months first to sort of co-design questions, then to come back and answer those questions, then to build scenarios. And all of it was kind of around this idea of the relationship between land use, land cover, biodiversity, and ecosystem services. This came for us um, from a couple of things. You know, So one was uh, at the time in this landscape, they had just committed to preserving 20% of the land in green space. And they were they had money to do it, and they were really hungry to try to figure out what green space uh, should be conserved or preserved, what they didn't need to worry about, what should maybe be restored, and did the sort of spatial pattern of that um, of that matter at all. This is kind of looking uh, roughly from the direction of Montreal out into this um, uh, out into this community. Um, so you know they had questions, or we together as a group had questions like, well how are services provided in this landscape anyway? Um, when do I need uh, natural capital? You know, when do I need nature? When can I rely on technology to get what I need in terms of preserving, providing a service? How can we be more resilient to different changes that are happening in this landscape that are coming from afar, might be economic, might be uh, ecological, uh, might be social? Uh, and then what's the best land use plan for us given demands now and likely future um, uh, demands for this region? Uh, so, you know, for example, <clears throat> if I think about it in terms of uh, these ecosystem service uh, bundles where the link of this, of this pedal tells you how much of a service is provided. So a long pedal means a lot of service. You know, they kind of said, okay, well, I can look at this part of the landscape and say that there's a lot of forest recreation going on on this mountain and some carbon sequestration and, uh, and things, um, but maybe not a lot of, of agriculture happening. Uh, there's maybe a different landscape with a lot of agriculture or yet another landscape with uh, really beautiful lakes and good water quality. And they kind of wanted to know, well, am I limited to only those sets? Or could I, you know, is there a way down here that I could pull this crop production arrow and make it long without reducing uh, some other uh, arrow? And we decided to head into this by thinking about configuration or placement of 
uh, of forest on the landscape. And we did that for a few reasons. One was this question coming about where do we preserve this green space uh, on the landscape, but also just our previous knowledge that it affects a lot of, of ecosystem services. So, you know, the one that I'm most familiar with of phosphorus runoff from agricultural areas, we know that having riparian buffers can do a lot to uh, let that water move more slowly and settle some of that phosphorus into the riparian before it gets into the river. Um, it's also true that uh, forest patches and the location and size of them affect the kinds of pollinators that are available, uh, which is really important in this region. So uh, we set out to measure a dozen different uh, ecosystem services across uh, this uh, larger region. Um, uh, every one of these blocks here is a municipality. Um, and we've got uh, 12 different ecosystem services measured across those municipalities. Um, and it turns out you get this sort of unique pattern for every service appears on the landscape uh, in, in sort of its own place um, in, 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 in kind of interesting ways. Um, and those bundles that we see then map onto what we know about the social system. So, um, you know, Montreal is over here and this area five is kind of where most Montrealers uh, have like a cabin and they go to like do their weekend recreation. And you see it shows up as this villages uh, um, uh, cluster where there is a lot of uh, nature appreciation and, and recreation um, uh, and cottages, you know, out in this, in this region. Uh, we uh, dug in <clears throat> a little bit to try to understand uh, why that's happening and to what extent is this about uh, the configuration of the, the landscape. Uh, this is work done by Kate Liss. Um, and uh, she looked at the composition, so just how much of each land cover type is there, and then things about how it's positioned on the landscape, like the shape of the patch, its connectivity to other similar patches, uh, and its position, and asked how much do each of these four influence the ultimate service provision. Um, and here's what we found. So you can see that composition in red does play a role, uh, especially for things like nature appreciation, maple syrup production, deer hunting, which are really important in this uh, landscape. But configuration is not unimportant. So it does matter where things are uh, on the, the, the landscape. We wanted to dig in from there um, and map these services at much finer scale. So instead of just having kind of one number for each municipality, for each service in a municipality, uh, Jesse Reed then went in and said, okay, I'm going to measure these at a 30 meter by 30 meter uh, spatial resolution, which is a lot smaller than most of our, our landscape uh, patches. We were able to get these really great maps of, uh, of agricultural production. Um, so you're looking here at just this generalized uh, kilograms of production per hectare per year that comes from uh, satellite data from looking essentially at the greenness of the, the landscape. Um, this is a method that's used by the Canadian government to um, replace surveys for monitoring crop yields. So it's a pretty well accepted uh, method. We were able to measure things like carbon storage based on uh, forest canopy height from LIDAR data. We measured uh, recreation based on photos that were posted to Flickr. Um, we also measured things like water quality uh, and water quality regulation, maple syrup production, a bunch of other uh, services that our stakeholders were telling us were um, uh, important in this region. We then came around to look at um, the land use in the region to help us identify what's going on in terms of composition and configuration. The, um, the, the way we went into this, rather than just trying to sort of overlay everything, is to 
think in particular about um, metrics that were uh, uh, that are important or that we thought were going to be important. So we looked at um, the diversity of different patch types, the connectivity and the distance to the edge, um, because those are three that are really meaningful or have been shown to be meaningful in the provision of services. Um, and when you plot these three, so here's a little three-dimensional axis with distance to the edge and diversity and connectivity. And when you plot these, you get these sort of like far distant points that give us a hint to like, what are the extremes? So you get, you know, patch centers in highly connected landscapes. So uh, that might be a bit of agriculture in a landscape that's all agriculture. Um, you get patch edges in highly connected landscapes. We get really fragmented landscapes with low diversity. So just very, very patchy, but not a lot going on. Uh, and then fragmented landscapes with lots of different things, wetlands and forest and agriculture um, going on. And then we mapped that back onto the landscape. So that's what this uh, uh, looks like. So here uh, in this light blue color is kind of my um, uh, patch centers and connected landscapes. And you can see that uh, we get these nice connected. Um, this actually happens to follow a river right here um, uh, in, the, in the landscape. And then what we did is map that back onto these uh, ecosystem services and ask not just how services play out on this landscape, but how do the interactions between services play out uh, on this landscape? So I'll just look at one of these just to give you a sense of this. So this is the relationship between deer hunting and maple syrup. And things that are below this white line uh, are trade-offs. So that's a place where in that part of the landscape, if you have deer hunting, you're unlikely to have maple syrup provision and vice versa. And then things above this line show places where there are uh, synergies. So what's interesting to me about this is it tells me that it, it isn't always that deer hunting goes with maple syrup on the landscape and it isn't always that they are opposed to each other on the landscape but rather it depends what the configuration is. And so that tells me that we can use configuration as a lever to try to pull some of those pedals, lengthen or increase the amount of a service that we get, and that we don't have to do that at the cost always at the cost of another service. Sometimes yes, but not always. Uh, so what did, this, uh, what did this tell us ultimately? You know, one that, Landscape configuration is influencing uh, both individual services and service interactions. We didn't find any one kind of configuration that led to more positive or fewer negative interactions overall. In other words, there's no magic bullet here of, oh, if you just do this to your landscape, uh, you're going to get what you want. But we were able to talk to the managers about the effects of configuration beyond just the immediate impacts of land use change to give them a sense of what tools were in their toolbox uh, for deciding where to spend this government money on restoring and preserving uh, woodland areas in the landscape. This went alongside a huge amount of uh, field research to pull together the data on the relationships between land use, land cover, biodiversity, ecosystem function, uh, an ecosystem service to understand exactly where these things matter and how. Um, so, you know, just to give you an example, um, we uh, were out there capturing bees and looking at bee diversity and pollination. We were um, measuring uh, trees, tree diversity, and carbon storage, looking at down woody debris uh, at a really massive number of, of insects trying to understand pollination, but also uh, insect interactions in the agricultural areas between uh, pests and predators. And we took all of that and then worked with our communities. So remember, we've been meeting all this time over this four-year project. Every four months, we've been meeting with these mayors, meeting with their land use planners, taking questions from them, talking about what we're finding. Um, and finally, we were able to get them together to 
talk about scenarios and see if we could develop some scenarios, which is really just um, a way to think about what possible futures are uh, for this region. And then in each of those to think about the relationship between land cover and biodiversity and, and ecosystem services. And we really wanted to help the community have better knowledge of trade-offs and then also just be a little bit more proactive. They were coming to us saying, we're just reacting all the time. You know, person X wants to build a bridge and we have to say yes or no. Person Y wants to build a, a mega mall and we have to say yes or no. They wanted to be more proactive. So um, we thought, you know, let's pull everyone together again. Let's talk about what possible futures are. Um, <clears throat> we came up with four um, different possible futures. Um, this one, uh, it's called like uh, more, it's still not enough. Um, you can ask me later about what it's like to work in your non-native uh, language with stakeholders. You say a lot of stupid things. So I'll, I'll just uh, leave that there. You can ask me about that uh, later. But um, in this one, we really were looking at uh, demographic growth and infrastructure and urban sprawl with a loss of uh, green space and what would happen to ecosystem services in the region if that happened. Um, we uh, had one uh, called Go to the Green, uh, which is a little bit about um, a government that, a uh, newly elected government that is really pushing uh, wind and solar energy in agricultural regions um, and uh, biomethane production. Um, and in each of these, what we were able to do is basically uh, we had what we called like the what if machine and we were able to um, use that model to uh, try to provide some range of different ecosystem service provision in the in the landscape. So if I give you just an example, um, this was one that we're still working on, but this is um, with a range of different uh, amounts of restoration. So 2%, 8% or 17% uh, of the land uh, being newly restored into forest and then choosing different ways of allocating that on the landscape, like either selecting the, the land that is degraded to start with, land that's abandoned or just choosing uh, at random and then trying to uh, map back out on this uh, six different ecosystem services and the provision that you would get in all of those um, in all of those settings. Okay, um, let me leave the Monterey behind for just a minute and just talk. I, I want to sort of bring this back to um, you know co-designing science. I feel like when we started, this was sort of our our model or the model at least that I was trained in. You know, you get some research funding, you do some research, uh, you apply it, and then benefits come out the, the the tail end. And by contrast, where we went with the Monteregi was really trying to move from that model um, to something that was really different, that was really about, you know building a common vision by integrating uh, our scientific knowledge with the knowledge that our land use planners and our mayors and our other uh, stakeholders in this project was a, um, a nature center and the chamber of commerce and some business people from the community. Um, but what I wanted to know when this got done was like, can we scale this up to a whole country? Because this was fun what happens if you try to do this for a whole country? So that's where ResNet came from, um, was what would happen if we tried to do this um, in a much larger kind of way? And so just to remind you, we're trying to answer our, our local uh, questions, understand ecosystem services, and then contribute to this national monitoring, uh, national monitoring system. So let me introduce you, I'll just introduce you to a couple of the landscapes to give you a sense of how, uh, of how these work. Every one of them is kind of following the same uh, sort of method that we used in the Monteregi of working with local folks to come up with the questions, jointly develop questions, um, do some science, develop scenarios, model outcomes, um, go back to those stakeholders. So, 
in the Bay of Fundy, um, these, let's see if I can get my cursor to work, these represent uh, dikes that are maintained by the Department of Agriculture um, here as well, here as well. The, those dikes have the job of holding back seawater and protecting agricultural regions. There's about 80 kilometers of it. Um, and the Department of Agriculture came to us and said, we can't afford to maintain all of it. We need to divest from something like 25 kilometers of this dikeland. Which can we give up? And which do we need to, to keep? Um, so we uh, ended up building a question that looked like this. How do we balance the services that are associated with dikelands, like biking, hunting, flood control, with those that are associated with the salt marshes that um, once replaced, or the salt marshes that uh, will happen when the dikelands uh, can't be maintained. And that's things like, uh, like flood attenuation. The folks leading this landscape have um, built the spaghetti diagram that is their conceptual understanding uh, of uh, both bringing together science and local stakeholders of um, how do we uh, get uh, either in the uplands or in the oceans, in the dikelands or the wetlands, through uh, anthropogenic actions and natural processes to a series of services. Um, what I like about this diagram, uh, this crazy spaghetti diagram, is that every student working on this landscape can come to me and say, this is my arrow. I'm doing this one right here. Uh, and kind of identify where they are and what their job is uh, in this larger landscape in terms of understanding the service trade-offs of salt marshes and dikelands. And we hope to come back to them with some better understanding that can help the Department of Agriculture um, make some decisions about where to divest from those dikes. Um, we are working uh, all the way on the opposite coast on trying to understand uh, ecologically safe and socially just operating spaces for Canada's Pacific coastal fisheries. Here, our partner is the Coastal First Nations, uh, the Great Bear Initiative, which uh, is a uh, collection of a dozen, I think now two dozen different uh, tribal nations who are working to improve uh, local uh, fisheries management. And here, the questions are not so much about spatial configuration of land use, but uh, how do we weave together contemporary ecological data with archaeological data and social science data alongside traditional knowledge and state-of-the-art monitor modeling to try to quantify change in indigenous-run uh, fisheries and model the benefits of those fisheries? Um, I'll just introduce one more, and then I'm going to move on. Uh, so this is uh, our landscape that is up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, here, the government of the Northwest Territories uh, came to us and said, hey, listen, climate change is going to create a massive amount of potential new cropland, building basically directly on what's now peatland. Um, what can we do to realize the potential of that while minimizing uh, negative impacts? This is a, uh, a territory with a tremendous amount of food insecurity. And so they're really trying to think about um, you know, how do we feed ourselves uh, without simply digging up uh, tons and tons of carbon out of the ground uh, and sending it into the atmosphere? Okay, so there's lots of values of doing this kind of local work. Um, that's, I think, why we do it, right? We can engage local actors. We can fit research to real questions. We know knowledge is more likely to be taken up. We know that it motivates action. We know it amplifies missing voices. It encourages cross-disciplinarity. It leads to more uh, uh, social ecological uh, integration. But you know, in our case, and, and maybe in your case too, we want to do something that's more than just contributing to individual landscapes. We want to somehow address these grand challenges and learn how to scale up from what we're learning to aggregate all of this place-based work into something that's more regional or more national or even more global scale by figuring out uh, how to draw general conclusions. 
And I mentioned that we're really focused on this ecosystem service observatory network of Canada. You know, how do we build this thing that lets us observe or understand what's going on um, across the whole country? There are a lot of challenges to that kind of, of, uh, of scaling up. Like, is the knowledge transferable from one place to another? What's the infrastructure for sharing knowledge? How do you even identify representative cases? We know pretty well how to incorporate multiple knowledge systems at a local scale, but how the heck do you do it at a national scale? And how do you get time scales and priorities to align when you've got power dynamics behind everything? Um, we have some solutions to that that we're working on. So for transferability, you know, we're thinking a lot about um, uh, integrating by what we've called place, case, and process, so following a similar process, using theory as a kind of lending library to organize ourselves around. Um, we've built ourselves an infrastructure for sharing that has this network of local cases, but that also scales up through these themes. Um, we uh, hopefully have uh, representative cases. In our case, we're really focused on ecosystem services and trade-offs in working landscapes. Um, some ways to incorporate multiple knowledge systems are to generalize about the importance of local or traditional knowledge. Um, and we're thinking about doing that by indigenous knowledge represented at all scales. So, um, you know, we have that knowledge represented all the way from our board of directors all the way uh, to uh, every theme and individual landscape. Um, and then we're thinking about, you know, aligning timescales and priorities. You know, how do we work with, uh, with key stakeholders from the very beginning? How do we invest in teamwork even when it sacrifices some of the short-term productivity? Um, and then how do we build multi-actor um, uh, landscape workshops to really deal with these, uh, these power dynamics? Um, our themes are doing a lot of the, the work of trying to um, think about this kind of scaling, addressing questions about you know, who benefits from the provision of services and how does that change as we move across scales or as uh, services move from place to place through species movement or water movement or even through uh, trade of products from, from one place to another. So, you know, I would say we're starting to engage with that question. I don't think we have a great uh, all the way uh, answer to it yet. Um, I want to use that to come back around for a second to where I started with this uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer and, and, uh, and Teddy Roosevelt to just say there's different approaches, I think, to how we think about um, place and placedness um, that I think are really important. They're fundamental to how we approach conservation, to how we approach our science, to how we approach um, just our place, our role uh, as uh, members of a place, as part of a uh, community of human and non uh, and non-human species. I, I don't have an answer yet to can you make those work together? Um, but this is my this is my going hypothesis um, of how these work together. Um, so this is a bust of a woman. It's a, a painting by Picasso. And why this is my hypothesis, you know, what Picasso is famous for is drawing faces one face from multiple perspectives in the same picture and getting extra value, extra beauty from being able to see things from multiple perspectives at the same time. And so my hope, my hypothesis is that by taking these different perspectives on uh, conservation and on our role in a place, we might be able to find ways to bring those together and to get extra beauty from the place and extra understanding of what it means to be uh, a person in a place and bring all of that to bear on conservation and on uh, management of these landscapes and places that we love. Um, 
there's we have loads of partners involved um resnet is now a um we started with 17 people we're now a network of uh of 125 we're split across about two dozen different universities and we've got uh, government partners and NGO partners and uh, local community partners, indigenous partners, um, all who play a really important uh, role in pulling all of this off. So I will uh, thank all of them for their roles in all of what you've seen today um, and thank all of you for spending the time with me and listening. And I hope that I've left uh, plenty of time for questions and plenty of time for us to just engage and have conversation together. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can do that a little better. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. I appreciate uh, the talk. And you, uh, we set a 45-45 split and you hit it uh, dead on. So that uh, <laughs> must have been practiced a time or two. <laughs> Only by talking very, very fast. <laughs> um, so we have time for Q&A. Um, so the way I think I'm going to do this, because there's a lot of questions in the chat, mm. but I think I'm going to start with if someone has questions they want to ask out loud, or if you have a question in the chat and you want to just ask it out loud, um, you should have a raise your hand feature um, in the reactions button. And if you do that, uh, you should come to the top and then um, mm. you can you should be able to ask your question, take yourself off mute. When you do start asking your question, if you could just briefly introduce yourself just so Dr. Bennett knows who you are and a little bit about yourself. So just your name and maybe where you work or, or what your interests are. So I see Scott, uh, I can't see your full name, Satter, Satter, Satter Waite uh, has his hand up. I probably absolutely mispronounced your name, so I apologize for that. Close enough. Um, yeah, my question was in the chat, but I, I need to get to a, another required webinar. Um, Elena, one of the things that came out to me was, have you, the city mayors that you talked to, were they interested in trying to help landowners upstream of them, uh, you know, increase their soil health uh, practices and those kind of things? Is that anything that was really talked about or, or I'm not sure what your situation is. Our situation in our area at Kansas Department of Health and Environment is, we're a private land state. We're agriculturally um, driven from an economic standpoint. And, and so we don't have the ability to buy land, um, put wetlands in around communities and so forth. So we're looking at actually trying to increase the ability for farmland to absorb this water and, and reduce our runoff. Yeah, that, it's a really interesting question. We also, you know, there's some ability um, because of this government program to buy up some of this land, but for sure, a lot of it has to be done with, um, uh, you know, working with communities to, to try to get some of this, you know, no-till cover crops. We're currently, I, I think, something like 65% no-till, um, which I think I think at least my understanding is like that's a pretty high percentage. Maybe someone can can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we did also one of our big partners in the Monterey was the local agricultural producers union, um, and so that was really important. Even just in the like lunchtime conversations, right, of the mayors and the land use planners talking to the producers union, saying, "So, you know, what's your latest information? What are you sharing with farmers?" where are farmers at with this? How can we convince people to be doing a better job? And so there was a lot just in this like interstitial conversation that had nothing to do with the science, but everything to do with just bringing people together in the same room to build trust and have those conversations. But I, I think it's happening. Thank you. Uh, it looks like I have John Sowell has your hand up. Uh, Sowell. Sowell. Yep. Hello, everyone. And thank you for your presentation. I very much enjoyed it. I uh, am an ecologist and landscape architect, formerly with the US National Park Service. I recently retired. And I've worked with a lot of things like this for decades. 
but um, I'm especially interested in uh, the impacts of climate change and resource preservation into the future. And this reminds me very much of the resilience school of thinking, the socio ecological uh, um, strategies for accomplishing this. Uh, I think you've done a great job. I, number one, I'd love to have a, a copy of, of your work if you can. Uh, that is to say, not everything, but <laughs> what you're, you know, the, the culmination of your efforts today as to what you're presenting to us. The second thing I'd like to ask of you, and this is not a criticism by any means, but you've probably heard so many people say, oh, we're going to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Don't worry. And uh, I'm thinking, as well as many colleagues that I know, are thinking 2050, you've got to be kidding, you're nuts. How about 2030 at, at max? And yet you look at the reality of things and how, how uh, everything's evolving. Well, good luck with that. You may need it by 2030. Some say 2025, ha ha. How are you going to do that? Therefore, the question is this, how can your system be applied to rapidly assess mega landscapes to achieve that end, admittedly at a less than ideal level of accuracy, but nevertheless achieving the essential aspect of what you're trying to achieve and then worry about refining it going forward. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, it's a great point and, an, and, a, and a difficult one, right? We're stuck between systems that change typically change kind of slowly, uh, people who change kind of slowly, uh, and the need to do things really, really fast. So I have two thoughts on that. And one is, you know, you see that um, the hockey stick diagram all the time, right, of like, change becomes exponential. And I may be just an overly optimistic person, but I think that we can do positive environmental change in an exponential way too, right? That like, Maybe we're just in the slow part of the curve and it needs to like bend up and then it's gonna take off. And a thing that we're doing now that I didn't talk about at all today is um, trying to look across Canada, identify what are the most, in, in our case, we're thinking about multifunctional landscapes. What are the landscapes that are sort of providing I struggle with this, not the best, but providing a mixed bundle of ecosystem services in a way that's like statistically different from the places around them. And then to say, well, what is it that they're doing? You know, is it management? Is it the way they're talking to each other? Is it that they're doing continuous no-till? Is it, you know, and to try to look at them as basically bright spots, examples of how we can do better in, in other places by contextualizing that. And I think that that's, a pretty powerful way to say we can do it and we're going to do it by looking at what's working and then just trying to rapid fire find out if those things can work in other places too mm -hmm. does yes. it get us there by 2025 i don't know and you could do the same thing for climate like if you, i'm talking about multifunctional landscapes but if you're interested in climate or carbon storage or whatever you could do the same thing. We've done it with forests in Quebec. You know, why are some forests storing so much more carbon than others? Yes. What is it about them? Well, it turns out it has to do with the people that own them mm. uh, in, in Quebec. Um, yeah. And, and the Canadian system is fundamentally different, similar but different from the American, as I've learned uh, in working with a lot of your, uh, your folks up there over time. And uh, that's good. That's also worrisome uh, from both sides of the border. And that's not a criticism. It is what it is. People are the wild card in this. And um, and that is my major worry. It's not the resources. It's the, you know, they, they are changing, but you can do something. It's the people that are the bugaboos. So yes, if, if there's a way that I could uh, get the essence of your um, findings, I, and do you need my contact information or do you have it? I Maybe I could send, can I make that, John, can I make that available through you? Like if I send yep. you a couple of papers and the slides from today or something like that, and then you can. Oh, send yes. It uh, but I don't know if you have my contact information. That's what so, I So what we typically have done on these, and I put the link in the chat 
uh, we have the a web page for this digital dialogue series and you'll actually see some information from the previous speaker Dan Williams and then we'll do the same thing with Dr. Bennett as well she'll put that information the slot uh, the presentation today all that will be uploaded in there so okay uh, just so I can find it that's <laughs> yeah so that link should be in the chat so if you want to click that and maybe bookmark it um okay I, I have to find it sorry I don't mean to take up everybody else's time I, I'll have to find it I'll put but, it I'll put it in there again when I get a moment if so, not John just send me an email and we'll yeah. do it we I don't do it have your contact email. information I had technical difficulties getting into this so I'm sorry so I've missed your introduction my apology to you I'll, I'll put it I'll put the link in the chat thank you I'm a problem yeah. child today I'm sorry Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, as hosting, I guess I want to take a chance to have a question here um, because this idea of scaling has been something I've been thinking about a lot with place. And I think about, um, and the reason why I started thinking about this honestly was during my PhD, I was working in Illinois and a lot of work around farm adoption is centered on the individual, which I always thought was a little interesting because I'm when you drive from let's say Champaign-Urbana to Rockford, Illinois for those who have done it it makes you wonder how did all of these individuals arrive at the exact same decision to grow corn and soybeans um, that's pretty unprecedented that everyone arrived at all these same decisions and so it made me think of well how are these individual places or these sites interconnected how how did farmer A agree with farmer B to do I mean and I some farmers would like to say their farm's not the same because maybe they plant their corn at a different width or they have a different brand of corn or something like that. But more or less, they're doing the same thing. Um, and so it made me think about like, what are the boundaries on a place? And yeah. so then I think about regions and what is the region? And um, is that socially defined or is a region something that's predetermined on a map? And who's constructing those places that interconnect places together? So how do a broad how does a broader place get created that interconnects a bunch of smaller places um and so i started thinking about that i don't know is that something you've been grappling with on these when you try to scale up and i'm thinking like that connection you drew from like montreal to the recreational i'm assuming some sort of second home cabin area and those interconnections across those places and and those boundaries, like where are the boundaries to a place and are they even bounded or are those boundaries socially developed or I don't, I guess maybe I'm just rambling now, but uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Man, I get myself totally wrapped up in this in part because one of the things that I find so complicated is when, you know, some services are, you can move, like they're fungible and you can move them around, right? So I can, I can convert corn to, to dollars by like, selling the corn and moving it to some other place. Um, but like recreation, I cannot move it to some other place. Like it is where it is and people either go there to recreate or they don't. And so because recreation and agriculture interact and one moves and the other doesn't, they have sort of different relationships to place. And then I get myself locked because I want to believe that place is like, well, it's about like who interacts with who. And when you have a community of people or species or whatever, they form a place. But like, is my, am I somehow connected to like the Chinese pig farmers who are buying corn from my neighbor? Like, I don't think so. I mean, they're connected, but they're not the same place. Nobody would argue that that's the same place. So I get, I get stuck in, in, in that I think it's really complicated. And where I end up eventually coming down is, well, we just need to be doing things at multiple scales. And I come right back to, you know, where I was at as a grad student in Wisconsin with, you know, Monica Turner telling me, well, look one scale above and look one scale below and, you know, see how things, how places are interacting. And that's going to tell you something interesting. And that's kind of the best place that I can come back to. Randy, I see you got a hand up. Yes, thanks, Dr. Bennett, for uh, such a wonderful presentation. It really resonates with the work that we're trying to do in Grassland 2.0. And so my question is related to that. Uh, you took us on this really grand scale and, and talked about transdisciplinarity and scenarios and co-design. And these are all 
things that we're trying to do in, a, in our Grassland 2.0 project uh, at much smaller spatial scales. We have these learning hubs that, that we call uh, uh, our place-based conversations and they're, they're local community conversations. And we're really committed to um, trying to help create the space for these conversations to bloom and bubble up from, from the grassroots, et cetera. Um, but one of the things we really are grappling with and struggling with is um, we're committed to not moving forward uh, too aggressively, lest we leave people behind or out of the conversation who really should be part of the conversation. And we're going to talk about making a place. It has to include everybody, you know, uh, maybe that sounds too Pollyanna, but it, if we leave people behind, it's not likely to really be an enduring or sustainable kind of thing. I'm just wondering if you can speak to any things you all have done or thinking about in terms of trying to bring people into the conversation who either they are have been left out in the past or maybe they're even antagonistic about the notion of a conversation about making place. Nonetheless, they're critical to the conversation. So let me let me stop rambling and just see what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, it also there's this question of like, how do you have how do you make space for those conversations and bring everyone in, and yet also do it fast enough? Like we we have this real pressing need for fast change, and conversation and trust building is slow. Um, I think about. Um, the, the guy who was showing up to my work in the Monterey from the Agricultural Producers Union. And, and he came to the first meeting and he went, hmm, and kind of sat there like this. And, and you know, it was so clear. I don't know who had made him show up or, or what, it, but it was very clear that someone had like told him he had to be there, someone who had power over him and he was not happy about it. But he showed up and he showed up again and he showed up again and he showed up again. And, you know, eventually by like year three, he was like, you know, I like this. And sort of came, you know, I eventually meant much later, he said, well, I just thought you were here to like tell me what to do and take my land. And when it turned out that you weren't and you really wanted to listen to me and know what I thought, then, it, you know, whatever it was, it like, slowly, very slow, but how, you know, there's a real question there for us about how do you do that in a small place at a fast enough speed? And then how do you scale that up to something that feels like it's, it's actionable in the way that we need it to be actionable? That's part of, I think, why we're trying to work with Statistics Canada as they build this, you know, national monitoring system is to figure out like, okay, well, we're not going to have trust building conversations, but can we at least measure the right stuff uh, at that scale to, to bring us forward? Um, I, you know, my, I think I'm not really answering your question. I'm dancing all around it, well, but, you know, maybe, maybe the answer is let's please stay in touch because I think you all are figuring out some of the answer to that. And I think that we're hopefully figuring out some of the answer to that. And the more that we can stay in touch, maybe the, the better we can just share what it is that we're learning about how to bring some of these things to scale and how to make them move uh, at a pace that seems appropriate given the, the scale and importance of the problems that we're facing. Yeah, and if I could just, pile onto that a little bit because what you said really resonated with me there. You talk about going to the data and trying to make sure that you're going after the right data and in the right ways and all that. And for, for us, I think it's largely been about coming up with some kind of boundary object, something mm -hmm. to put on the table for every conversation that is compelling enough that even if you think you're antagonistic about the conversation, you're, you're willing to kind of, you know, kick at it or pull at it or tug at it. So that at least you're there, even if you're even if you're antagonistic, you're there. And hopefully along the way, that bridges and builds some connections that are hard to get rid of. Um, but you know, that's all that's all a little arm wavy and vague, but <laughs> that's what we're trying yeah. to do at least. But but important, and I see someone just put into the the chat about listening. And that really that was a huge lesson for me was like figuring out how to really listen, like not to come in with my agenda of what I wanted to do, but to like really listen in a way that was open 
um, and, and to do the science in a way that was listening and that was open, regardless of whatever we'd written our proposal to do. We've got some benefits in terms of the way proposals get funded and in Canada, we've got a little bit more space to take a left turn if our stakeholders tell us that we need to take a left turn, but um, that listening piece, I think, is is really, really key because I've seen it turn people around who are antagonistic, but then when they realize they've got a place at the table that isn't just, um, it isn't just for show or or for whatever, but that we're, we're actually taking them seriously. I've just seen it time and time again, turn people around. So I think it's, it is really important that that part and science isn't kind to it. It's not structured well to make that easy to do. Claudio, I see you have a hand up. I do. Hi, Elena. Fantastic. I'm so excited that uh, that you're here telling us about your story, which has been actually quite inspirational for, I think, the work that we do. And um, we hope to have, you know, some of the successes that you have all have, have had. Um, I want to follow up on this persistent question of scale, uh, which is really, I think, um, you know, it, it poses some challenges. A lot of these conversations about place, at least in my very small brain, have to do with the local communities in which these the local challenges are being uh, felt and uh, dealt with and what is appropriate for a particular place. And so how do you create change um, with an understanding of the place, uh, those spatially structured interactions and all the multifunctionality that goes along with it, which at the which is embedded within a broader context, which includes regional uh, governments, authorities, uh, laws, rules, uh, incentives, markets, uh, and so on. Uh, so we, we think about you know, the, the different pressures of change coming from the bottom up, those local place-based conversations, and yet also need or maybe are pushed even faster by those top-down uh, types of uh, forces that might be a bit disconnected from that place uh, conversation. And so I'm just thinking about, you know, the scalability, you know, question, like, how do you take the place um, thinking um, and now have it work within a regional context or a national uh, context like that? And I don't know if you've given a lot of thought about that, that you could share with us. Oh, man. <laughs> you guys are just going for the hard questions, one question after question after question. Um, I, I do think that the top down has an important role. And, and a lot of that is like in setting the tone or the stage or making avenues available that might not otherwise be available or making avenues um, that are available, making them more appealing, right? And there's all kinds of ways that top down governance can use, um, you know, policies or incentives or other things to sort of change the way that the map looks if we're choosing, you know, which which pathways to, to go on. Um, the, the other piece of that, of course, is like how to think about how to articulate this, but like what piece of the context matters in order to figure out whether thing, thing that worked in place X is going to work in place why and and at least in Canadian agriculture, I feel like we struggle with that a lot. Like I read a lot of science that is in this particular place at this particular time. If we do this kind of agriculture in this way with our left hand tied behind our back, it improves this ecosystem service. And then it's like, well, how the heck am I going to compare that to any other place? And so that like ability to it's not scale in the physical sense, but it's like the ability to abstract out and know what's likely to get us closer to where we want to be, what's likely to bring us farther from where we want to be, I think is something that we really struggle with because there's so much that is contextual, you know, not only in, well, this works on this soil type, but not on that soil type, the sort of like bio geophysical parts, but then there's the cultural parts too, right? There's the like, well, in this community, this is the way we've always done it. We grow this because that's what we know how to grow or that's what we have the equipment for or, 
you know, I went and talked to my neighbor and they were having good luck with this. And so that's what I do. You know, those, I think we're starting to learn how change works that way, but it's way, you know, it's, it's stuff that I read, but it's really stuff where I rely on the sociologists and social scientists and social psychologists around me to tell me much more about how that works because it's way above my pay grade. Lena, if I still have the the chance here as uh, with the uh, with the microphone, so to speak, um, I I didn't hear you say too much about economics. Um, we we find that in some of the conversations that we have with our uh, farming communities, that is often what is led with, like, yeah, I'd be interested in making some change, but the numbers had better work out. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how does that fit into the conversations in Canada? Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. I mean, there's, you know, nobody, somebody before mentioned that this is all, you know, private land and nobody, people are not stupid. You know, we're not going to take risks that put our, our, our families or ourselves or our, uh, or our farms at risk in service of something that, you know, somebody thinks might, might work. So it, that's, absolutely an important part of the of the ball game and that is where some of the top down you know policies governance economics can come in and and try to you know nudge things and and make things more appealing in, in certain directions but um you know always for me with a a word of caution because it's really easy for those things to go not where we expected them so the the really famous example in quebec is uh in the in the 80s, Quebec actually put in place policies that mandated every farmer had to balance their nitrogen and phosphorus budgets every year. So basically had to make a plan, figure out, you know, how many, how many hectares of land do I have? How much corn or soy or whatever am I going to plant? How much phosphorus is that going to remove from the soil? That gives me how much I'm allowed to put on. Um, sounded really you know great kind of advanced for the 1980s forward thinking in terms of uh you know cleaning up our waterways uh what immediately happened is that every farmer who had animals did a back of the envelope calculation realized they didn't have enough land to spread their manure on and cut down all the woodlots in order to grow more corn that they had no interest in growing but they just needed the land to spread uh to spread manure on so you know, that's a case of where this, you know, apparently good looking top down policy leading with um, maybe not leading with economics, but, you know, they got the system boundary wrong and it went a direction they didn't expect. And so I think, you know, there's some caution we need to have on that down that road as well. So I'm going to work into the uh, the chat box here. Um, I'm Corey Nyquist. I think you're still on um, the call here. I see your question you have here. I don't know if you want to ask it out loud or if you want me to. I'll give you a chance to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a little bit of some connection issues, so hopefully I can just ask it here. Thank you so much for that really great uh, presentation. And um, so I'm a postdoc at the University of Minnesota right now researching um, barriers to citizen science participation in stream ecological research. So I found a lot of like your data collection and stakeholder involvement uh, really interesting, um, especially at like a national and like regional levels. So I was wondering, uh, within the goal to develop science that connects people across landscapes and ecosystem services, how are you engaging stakeholders with data collection in a way that involves them further with the kind of entire uh, process and also um, the landscape beyond just initial landscape or eco, uh, eco ecological services kind of concerns? So this is something I'm kind of interested in with my research, kind of thinking about how does involvement of citizen scientists or stakeholders in the data collection process and kind of in not only just the initial um, like what sort of questions are we interested in answering but more involved in the entire almost scientific process how does that foster their connection to place mm -hmm. and also their involvement with management and um, kind of valuing those ecosystem services more thanks cool um really cool question 
So it's interesting because I think I came at it from a pretty different perspective in that we had seen some uh, we had seen some citizen science where people were involved in collecting data, but not weren't given the opportunity to be involved in question development. So we really had this strong focus on engaging our stakeholders in the question development to see if that was going to have a big impact. Um, we had some engagement with data collection. You know, a lot of farmers would come out with us onto their fields and you know they were curious about what we were finding or collecting um some but not a lot and we didn't really do much that was like you know real citizen science of the kind i think that you're doing where you where you've got people actually you know doing the bulk of the of the um of the data collection we did bring people back in with a several different activities because we were committed to having everyone come in you know every four months um, so after we had the video development, we brought everybody back in, for example, and had them all role play different roles and talk about, you know, which scenario was their favorite given whatever their role was, and they had to interact with each other in a, in a variety of different ways. And, and that was pretty useful to sort of, um, uh, you know, get people engaged and involved in seeing things from, um, from each other's perspective. I, I'm, I'll be curious to see where it goes with ResNet. You know, we're in the first couple of years and we put so much time into that kind of engagement in, in the Monteregie. I'm not sure that it's realistic to ask people to do that in their own landscape. Some are um, because they're committed to doing that kind of science, some less so, uh, let's, let's say it that way. But, um, uh, you know, I. It, it takes a lot of time and there's a real trade off there between, you know, whatever, you know, papers you can write or other things that you can do in that in versus the time that you spend in engaging those those stakeholders. So I'm not sure how much more stakeholder engagement we'll be able to do or at what scales. Yeah, thank you for that. That was that was really helpful. All right, uh, let me see. Julie, it looks like you just put a question in the, Julie Dahl just put a question in the chat. I'm wondering if you just wanna go ahead and ask that. Um, yeah, I can do that. Thanks, John. So Elena, I really appreciated your thoughts. Um, and I have kind of more of a, maybe a practical question. <laughs> I was involved in a mapping project with a local community and Honestly, I'm not sure how much the maps were used after the project was ended. And so my question is related to that. It seems like it can, they can be highly resource intensive, right? And um, there's a lot of maybe resources to fund someone to create these maps and whatnot. How have you seen, especially in the one specific region you mentioned, which I can't remember the name of, um, how have you seen those maps being used? What challenges did you have with the maps? I just want to hear all about the maps, both the current maps and then also the future, the maps of like showing future scenarios. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they're being used somewhat. And here's, this is, you know, where it comes to the answer that I gave to, to, to Corey's question about, about engagement is like, it's a tremendous amount of work. And you know it got used a bunch, and and part of why it got used, we had in this nature center, we had one of our partners who was like incredibly politically savvy and knew all of these mayors, and you know every time there was an election, he made sure that we were talking to all of the candidates and uh, and getting in there. So I think because of him, this got used probably more, I would say, by the community that was already committed to environmental things and by these mayors and land use planners because they were um, mandated to be trying to preserve this green space and they just needed to figure out where and so any map was better and and they you know we had a trusting relationship that built i wish they were used more um than than just that i mean i think i would have had to stay continually engaged and probably like quit my job in order to get them to be used more. One of the things that we're doing now with 
ResNet and with the scenarios and the mapping exercises is I actually have a student who is studying the learning and empathy impact of being engaged uh, in doing science in this way. So we're actually studying, he is studying the stakeholders that come to our scenario development workshops that engage with building these maps that uh, are going out and collecting the data to try to see whether whether and how it is influencing uh, what they learn, what they know, what they believe about the landscapes that they live in, and then how they're interacting with those. Um, that's still, it's like TBA, what, what, what we're going to find from that, but the hypothesis is that engaging in this way uh, increases empathy for one another, and through increasing empathy, increases learning, and that hopefully should mean that these things then get more get more used or even if they're not used directly that the the interstitial knowledge that comes from being part of it gets incorporated into whatever they're doing next if they're not turning to our map and saying oh we need forest at you know at, at this particular intersection they're at least using the knowledge of ecosystems provide ecosystem services and that benefits people and those services interact and that may be more important as a leverage point, that kind of learning than whether they're, you know, going to the particular place on the map that we identified and, and restoring a forest. Thanks. That's helpful. I, I also am curious, you know, I wonder if it matters who kind of holds the maps afterwards, right? Um, yeah. I'm thinking of Harvard Forest and Harvard Brook LTER, like they've done some, worked with some great partners so that their future scenarios work is really kind of ends up in the hands of the community, you know, maybe in a very similar way as your work too, but now they have an online tool. And I think it's, it's just like a lot of momentum around the maps. <laughs> um, but yeah, I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I wish that we had done more of that. I mean, to be, to be completely honest, it was really hard to, for me, to work in French and to engage in French. I just, I'm like about as subtle as a freight train. I can speak French, but I just can't do it with any sort of subtlety. And so doing that sort of continual engagement, staying on the ground was was really hard. And it, if it's turned out to be a great place to work, but it probably wouldn't be, I wouldn't pick, I wouldn't choose to work in a language that I don't speak if I could do it uh, if I had my choice, because I think I could just stay engaged and do more with it if I had more facility or fluidity with language. So we have time for about one more question. And on that topic, of language might be a good thing to maybe finish off on, because I, I think it's um, that makes a lot of sense. And a recent experience um, I've had doing work in it I, this is a reminder that I experience it a lot. I work in all English speaking areas, but um, language is cultural too. And the acronyms people use and the language people use is um, rooted in the culture you are in. And so when you are on a college campus, the language is used in one way. And if you go out into a, um, into a farm, they'll be talking about a different language and it's hard to keep up with that sometimes. And even and interdisciplinary work. Um, uh, one thing I've experienced is when I use concepts and names, I think of a whole field of literature that is what I'm thinking about when I say that term. But, you know, I might be talking to an ecologist or a hydrologist or someone who, when I use that term, takes it a whole, associates it with a totally different meaning. So uh, maybe that's a good question to kind of finish off on what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, for sure, right? I mean, you know, there's language in the very basic sense of, uh, you know, a French doing doing work in a French speaking community, but there's also language in just sort of the way that we speak to each other in different communities, right? The kinds of language that I use or the approach that I take is really different when I'm talking to my researcher community versus when I'm talking to my, um, to my farmer community, because yeah, because we're, You've got different assumptions about how the world works in your head, right? Or, or what's maybe not different assumptions about how the world works, but you're coming from a different perspective, and that influences the the language that you use and the way that you use those words and just the way that you're 
you're approaching things. And I think um, one thing I will say about being in an all English language setting is I bet it's much easier to overlook the differences in language than it is for me, right? Like you might be using a word and your farmer that you're working with is also using the same word and you you can go for a long time thinking that you're talking about the same thing before you realize that you aren't. And for me, it's like right in my face. I know right away, like, nope, I got no idea what you just said. Um, you know, or, or everyone in the room laughs at me and I think, meh, okay, whatever I said was not right. Well, that's awesome. I think we're kind of bumping up against time here. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Bennett for her talk. I always feel like Zoom into Zoom talks is always kind of weird because you kind of just disappear off into the silence instead of up to a nice rounding uh, round of applause. I guess there's a couple digital round of applause here, but really appreciate uh, the talk and look forward to following up and keeping up with uh, the work up your guys' way. And hopefully we can stay in contact with one another. Um, as we go forward that would be great I really really would like that I, I I look to you all as one of the like leading lights of cool stuff happening in this space right now so it would be just awesome to uh to stay in contact absolutely and I just put in the chat again the link for the digital dialogue series we're going to upload um all the information from Dr. <laughs> Bennett that we're going to correspond on there's information from the prior presentation with Dr. Dan Williams and then in two weeks, we have um, May Davenport, Dr. May Davenport from the University of Minnesota, um, who will be talking about some of her work uh, around place-based conservation. So I uh, appreciate everyone showing up today. I think I got to double check with Carl, but I think today might have been an attendance record. I think I saw 157. So I appreciate everyone attending. Um, and it's uh, really awesome to be able to have these conversations like this. So I uh, appreciate it and everyone have a good rest of the day. Thanks everybody. All right. Bye.